Welcome to Become a Conflict Guru, Module 6, What? Here we are at the outer ring of the golden circle, the what. And what is our observations? What we're observing other people's are saying and doing. A conflict guru sees behavior and words as an outward manifestation of the inward feelings expressing the inner needs that are being satisfied or not. This is key if we are going to interpret others' actions and deal with conflict in a way that strengthens our relationships and helps us get the best results possible. I'd like to jump in by having you look at this photo. What are your observations of this guy? When I show it to people in workshops, I'm amused by the observations they share. I'm going to show you how this went with a small group I worked with. Their comments are pretty typical to those I've heard over the years. If you'd like to come up with your own observations before hearing theirs, please pause the video, jot down your notes in your workbook, and come back when you're ready. If so, I think you'll be amused and have some realizations of your own. My very first question to you is, what's your observations here? He's mad. Clearly he's about to talk trash. <laughs> he's mad, he's... Frustrated. Frustrated? He looks happy to me. Yeah, I was going to say, he looks like he's... Yeah. 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 He looks like he's joyriding. Yeah. 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 Cat calling, that's what he looks like. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to see, like, I'm trying to see it differently. Like, maybe he sees a friend, he's like, yo, let's hang out. Okay. Or something, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Mark, honey, what's your observation of this guy? I don't like him. <laughs> Simple. Okay. He's, a, he's a stoner. He's a stoner. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, Peggy, your observations? He feels like he's smarter than everybody else, mm -hmm. and yeah. he he's you know telling somebody who he thinks is stupid. Okay. I think he, he's a Republican. Oh, <laughs> I, I got my okay. You know. okay. I would almost say non-voter. <laughs> that would be my no, I'm good. I'm good. I can yeah. see that. So, uh, I can see that. Would you all be surprised <laughs> that none of those were observations? Hmm? Hmm. None of what? the things you said were observations. No. They were all meanings that you created in your head about this guy. Hmm. Uh, observations well, are he's wearing a watch. That's the number four. He's in a car. <laughs> observations are facts. And we take facts and we interpret them. Uh, Robert Keegan, who teaches at uh, Harvard, uh, the adult learning, said, in the absence of facts, we make it up. We are meaning-making machines. That's what we do. And often we create meanings in our head, and that's the cause of our problems. We've created all these meanings, but they're not facts. So, <clears throat> and usually, I think those meanings are, they tend to be not very generous, and they tend to be negative, uh -huh. rather than giving somebody the benefit of the doubt that, oh, he's trying to point out, you know, a, you know, a difficulty in traffic, you know, we always take the negative route. Yeah, and still, the positive is still a meaning, it, until we gather facts. In the absence of facts, we make it up. We are meaning-making machines. When we interpret what we see and hear, we are making up meanings that may be so or they may be way off base. We are meaning-making machines, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. This is just what we do to make sense out of all the goings-on in our lives. But as you just saw, we have a tendency to go negative and not necessarily attribute the nicest meanings when we don't have the facts to support them. To show you how easy it is to make up meanings, turn to this exercise in your workbook. Starting with the statement, the neighbor's dog pooped in my yard, creates excessive meanings about this statement, each building upon the previous meaning you created. First create three to four negative meanings, and then stop, and then go back and create three or four positive meanings. Pause the video now and do this on your own. 
and then come back and restart the video so you can watch a group do the same exercise. His dog pooped in my yard. Your neighbor's dog pooped in your yard. That means that he doesn't really give a rat's ass about your yard. That's right. He doesn't really give a rat's ass about your yard, so that means your neighbor kind of sucks. And he didn't. Your neighbor sucks, and that's because he uh, is a Republican. <laughs> He's a Republican, and that means that we'll never get along. We'll never get along? That means uh, we'll never really understand each other. We'll never really understand each other. That means that uh, I'm going to have to uh, do something bad to my neighbor's yard to make up for it. You have to do something bad to your neighbor's yard. That means is that you want to get revenge on him. <laughs> so if you'll start it again, Tommy, oh, and we'll go positive now, okay? We're going to yeah. look at each other, okay? Okay? Same thing. Neighbor pooped in my yard. Neighbor's dog pooped in my yard. <laughs> my neighbor's dog pooped in my yard. Neighbor's dog pooped in his yard. That means he wants to fertilize our yard. I mean, he wants to fertilize your yard, so that means he must really want your flowers to grow back. And he wants my flowers to grow back because he wants to encourage me to win the Neighborhood Beautiful Yard Prize. And he wants to encourage me to win the Neighborhood Beautiful Yard Prize, and that means that he really wants to see that trophy through my window. And he really wants to see that trophy through my window. That means he's an actually a good friend of mine. He's a good friend of mine, and that means that um, we're going to get him to contribute uh, a lot more to the Community Homeowners Association and build a, a big swimming pool here. And he's going to build a bigger swimming pool here because he wants to unite the community more and bring them all more together. He wants to unite the community and bring them all together because he really loves everybody. Yes, he really loves everybody, including you. Yeah! <laughs> the dog pooping in your yard. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But there, there's always going to be a positive side to it in some way. And I mean, if only for the benefit of the dog. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? So we have a choice if we focus on negative or we focus on positive and we can create meaning making in our head on it. You know, we're meaning making machines, that's what we do. And we have a saying where focus goes, energy flows. If we focus on the positive, we'll put energy there. If we focus on the negative, we'll put energy there. So wherever we're focusing, we're going to create meaning around that. This exercise just goes to show you that we truly are meaning-making machines. What's also revealing is that where focus goes, energy flows. If we focus on negative meanings, we can keep the ball rolling with negative meanings as easily as we can if we focus on positive meanings. It's a common misconception that facts and meanings are the same and we lump them together as if they are the same thing. They are not. They are very different. So let's separate them out. My neighbor's dog pooped in my yard. This is a fact. I saw him do it or someone else did and they can verify it. That my neighbor is an inconsiderate jerk because he let his dog do that or that I'm thrilled to have my yard fertilized is just what I made up about this simple fact. Meanings interpretate facts and then we relate to these meanings as if they were facts. That's where we get in trouble. The problem is that subjective meanings are not, indeed, objective facts. Meanings often reflect our values or beliefs, which is understandable. However, if our meanings are not grounded in facts and we are relating to them unconsciously as if they are facts, then this is where the real trouble begins. Let's look at the difference between facts and meanings. Facts are what you can see or hear. They are external evidence of the situation. Meanings, on the other hand, are just in our heads. Your internal conversation about the situations. Facts can be verified by other people, 
while meanings are my personal story or interpretation. Facts cannot be changed, while meanings can be changed in a heartbeat since they are influenced by our past experiences or future fears. Therefore, facts are highly influential and meanings are less so. A lot of people have pushed back on this concept, saying that it is their truth and their fact. Something really did happen to them, they interpreted it, and now it has become their internal fact. Like, Sally is so disrespectful. Nice end around, but if it happened to someone else, would they come up with the same conclusion? No, Sally just knows what she wants, she's clear about it, and she goes after it. You go, girl, yay! Different meaning. Let's say your boss said to you, you need to take more initiative. You might interpret that as saying, hmm, I need to step it up, I'm not pulling away weight. It's now become your internal fact that your boss thinks you're a slacker. But what if the boss said the same thing to someone else? Would they have interpreted it the same way? No, uh, the boss thinks I have great ideas and I just need to speak up more. Now, in instead of being a slacker, I'm a star, albeit too reserved, I just need to speak up more. Same original fact, different meanings. While we might think our meanings are our truth, it's not the same with everyone else. Let me run through a few quick examples. Fact, my father slammed the door. Meaning, my father has anger issues. Fact, I attended community college. Meaning, I didn't have the opportunities others had. Fact, Janet was five minutes late, meaning Janet is disrespectful of my time. The meanings created may overemphasize or minimize the actual fact and lead down a path not intended. Facts are more influential than meanings, and this is an exercise to show you what I mean by that. When you state a meaning like threatened, others have a sense of what that means from their experience, but not exactly what you mean by it. If, however, you shared some facts, they will know exactly what happened that led you to the conclusion that you were threatened. Go ahead and try your hand at this. Pick one word that describes an imaginary person and then come up with three facts that could be seen or heard by others that would lead others to guess the meaning word. Make sure you don't use any additional meanings in your statement of facts. Focus on what was seen or heard, quantifiable or observable information. Then show someone the list, read your facts, and see if they can guess what word you are describing. After you've done this, continue the video and you'll observe a group doing this exercise. The group divided themselves into triads, chose one word, and then came up with three facts that they read to the group. Then the group guessed at the word they picked. I'm going to share with you three facts, and then you're going to look at these words and tell me which word I picked. And then we're going to partner up with three people in a and come up with three facts, and you're going to read the facts to the rest of us, and we're going to tell you which word you pick. So the idea here is facts, if we share facts, we can help people along in their meaning making. Because these are all meanings, right? None of these are facts. Okay, so uh, here's, here's three facts. I went into my boss's office, and she said, if I didn't have the report to her in the morning, I'd be fired. The next day, uh, I, or that afternoon, I went to a friend and asked him to help me with the report, and he said that I ought to be fired if I don't do it myself. And thirdly, uh, I didn't volunteer for the project, and my boss fired me. 
So which word did I pick? Isolated. Threaten. Threaten. Threaten is the word. Isolated could be possibly. So I brought your meaning along with the facts. And if you're going to help people create meanings in their head, share facts. That will do it. If you create meanings, then it's your meaning against theirs. So which one, which group would like to share their facts first and then we'll guess at the meaning? Who would do that? Marconi and Brittany? She told me that I was not doing a good job. Okay. She posted a job opening with the same title as mine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she told me to learn to do the report or turn in my keys. All facts, right? No meanings in there? And what was the word that they picked? I think it's, I think it's intimidated. Yeah. Yeah. Intimidated? Mm -hmm. Ah, very good. See, it's facts, like bring everyone's thinking along when you share the facts. They, hey, yeah, yeah, I get it. That's intimidation. Good. Yeah. How about this other group? Okay. My boss stated in the performance review that I should up my proficiency. Um, she stood over my shoulder while I pulled all of my files. She yelled in my face, demanding my reports. Okay, pretty factual. Yeah. Okay, and what word did they pick? No. Intimidated. Yeah. Ah. Mm -hmm. So, facts are critical to bring other people's meaning-making machines along. Facts bring everyone's thinking down the same path to help create the same meaning. Common examples of meaning stated as facts, always, never, a lot, sometimes, angry, upset, etc. Some is not a number and soon is not a time. Be specific in order for it to be a fact using exact quotes of what people said and specific times and frequencies. Three out of five times is a fact, and a lot or some is a meaning placed on that fact. Since we are meaning-making machines, it's going to take some effort not to throw your meaning in with the facts when you are trying to convince them of anything. Careful, meanings aren't nearly as good as facts to convince someone. In the following video, I will share a story about how a simple fact can dramatically change our meanings. We've been talking about observations, how they're what we see or hear. They're the facts of the situation that shape our perspective and create the meanings in our lives. A few years ago, I purchased a new car, a Cadillac CTS, and I had it for about two weeks and went downtown Austin for a lunch meeting at a restaurant. As I pulled up, I saw I was gonna park on the street and in front of me was this old Toyota Corolla. And I thought, hey, I'd park in front of that in case anyone came along and sidestriped the cars. It hit that car, not my brand new car. As I was sitting in the car, gathering my materials for my meeting, I noticed a lady coming out of the restaurant and getting into the Toyota Corolla and I was looking at my paperwork and pretty soon my car started moving and I heard this sounding of scraping metal <laughs> right along the left side and I looked to the left of me and there was this lady with big eyes looking at me and I said back up back up and as she backed up I heard the reverse sound of screeching metal <laughs> backwards and she pulled back in uh, behind me and I thought oh no my new car what is up with this lady and man, can't she drive? What's her problem? And I had to crawl over the council of my car to get out the other side. And as I got out, the lady had gotten out and she was laying on the front of her car crying. And I thought, oh, she's upset about hitting my car. You know, what's her problem? And as I went over, I grabbed her and turned her around. Her eyes were crying, little old lady. And she said, I was just here picking up my husband's last check. He died of a heart attack last week. That one additional fact changed my entire perspective, the whole meaning on her being present to driving and what was going on with her life. 
one fact is so much influential and can change our entire perspective on any situation. And if we slow down, take that curious pause, slow down our meaning making, and ask what facts might I possibly be missing and get curious about the facts, it can possibly change our entire meaning. Watch out. The negative meanings you create will create conflict, for they are the verbal expressions of your feelings and conceal your unmet needs. When you stay in your meanings, it can create some terrible fights with others. We'll now watch two co-workers and a couple fighting about the meanings they have created about each other, and then we'll do an exercise that will help you maneuver past the meanings through feelings in order to get to the needs that have been concealed and are driving the meanings. Uh, Ms. Thompson, uh, I have to say, uh, I, feel, I feel really um, manipulated every time you come in here and you try to force me to do things that are not even part of my job. I just, you feel manipulated? Yeah. Your job is to do what I tell you to do, and when you don't do it, I feel really disrespected. Well, I mean, I feel like, sh sure, I mean, it, but I feel criticized every time you come here telling me that uh, I'm not doing it right, even though I'm trying my hardest. You, you just don't get it. I don't get it. I used to have your job. If you would just listen to me, then we wouldn't be having all these problems. Ugh, you always do this. Whoa, whoa. No, You're... no. No, don't tell me to calm down. I'm not going to calm down. I didn't even tell you to calm down, but I you do need to calm down. I don't need to You're calm down. You're being irrational. I'm not being irrational. You're being very irrational. You always leave me. You always abandon me. You always do that. You think I'm abandoning you? Yes. How, how, when do I ever abandon you? You always abandon me. Anytime we go to the store or anywhere, I'm like, babe, will you please stay? Oh, I'm going to try this on. And I come out, and you're like halfway at the GameStop. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You think that I'm just doing that? I'm, you're misunderstanding me. I'm going out looking more be for better stuff, you know, or other stuff. At GameStop? Are you freaking kidding me? For who? Who okay, is that okay, for? Okay, okay, okay. You need to stop with the crazy right now. Uh, you're coming uh, at me too hard. Are you serious right now? Yes, look at you You're right calling now. me crazy? Listen you to yourself. You wonder why I'm crazy. You just call me crazy. You want me to be rational God. you call me crazy? See, I can never talk because all you do is just attack me. That's oh all you God. ever do. So how do we get to needs when you've been making up all these meanings in your head? To understand that, there is a progression from our needs, the feelings, to the meanings that we all create is how we do it. Look and see how they are all connected in the downloadable document I provided for you. The feelings and needs listed after the meanings are just suggestions. There may be a myriad of other feelings and needs that have not been listed. Meanings are your interpretations of what has happened. Meanings are strongly influenced by our feelings, which are influenced by whether our needs have been met or not. It's a little bit like the song, the ankle bone's connected to the leg bone, and the leg bone is connected to the knee bone, and the knee bone is connected to the thigh bone. Meanings tend to be judgments, blames, and complaints, so if we get stuck in our meanings, it's unlikely we will be able to shift the conversation from conflict to creativity because we've created a wall separating ourselves from others through our negative meanings. Shifting the focus onto meeting of needs is what builds the connection that unleashes creativity, collaboration, and positive feelings between people. In order to pierce through the wall of negative meaning someone has created, I like to use a simple script to curiously investigate about the needs behind the meanings. It looks like this. When someone states a negative meaning, like, I feel you disrespected me. I will restate whatever negative meaning they said, followed by guessing at whatever negative feelings they may be having before curiously investigating about their underlying needs that have not been met. They can then confirm or we can identify their underlying needs together. So let me show you how this worked in real life when coaching a client of mine. 
Let me show you how this formula works in real life. While coaching the chief marketing officer of a hospital, he said to me, no, I'm not meeting with the CEO. All he does is castrate me. I said, hmm, so when I hear you say castrate, are you feeling alone, scared, and vulnerable? He said, yes. I said, so are you wanting a new level of safety and respect when you meet with the CEO? He said, yes. I said, okay, let's talk about how you could design a conversation to have with him so you could have that safety and respect you're looking for. You see, as a coach, there is nothing that I could do with his meaning as head of castrate, but there was a lot that I could do to help him get that safety and respect he was wanting when he met with the CEO. So we designed a conversation that he would have with the CEO. He agreed to have it. And the following week he said, you know, the CEO really responded to that conversation. We put some agreements in place and he didn't realize he wasn't creating that safety and respect for me. It helped meet both of our needs. So now we're going to watch several people use this formula, trying to go take the meanings and go through the feelings to get to the needs. Then they can talk about meeting the needs and staying stuck in the meanings that's simply going on in people's heads. I feel you bullied me. So when I hear you say that I bullied you, um, I'm hearing that you were, you're angry and you're scared. Yes. And you probably need, you know, some safety and some choice. Let's talk about that. That's it. Very good. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I'm feeling that when you didn't uh, fulfill your obligations that you manipulated me. Um, I, I hear you that you feel manipulated. Are you feeling powerless and frustrated? I am. Uh, perhaps um, it's because we need to work on trust, equality, and respect between each other. I'd like to talk about that. Okay. Good. As you can see, they're going to have to work on this a bit to make it their own. It will take some work to get there, and I believe it is very worthwhile. So here's a quick distinction or difference between meanings and feelings. If you can say by you after the word, it is an interpretation of meaning you're projecting onto them. So here's an example. I feel betrayed by you. Or I feel abandoned by you. The feeling may instead be sadness or anger that comes from within. When you focus on the needs behind the meanings, your energy goes towards building a human connection between yourself and another person, allowing you now to address how they would like to have their need met. This is where creativity comes into play. When you name the need, the conflict loses its charge because now you're going to talk about how to meet the need. Another way to do this, when someone speaks to you using a meaning word, guess straight at the underlying need without guessing at the underlying feelings. Example, if someone says they feel dumped on, respond by asking, are you saying that you need support and respect for your time? If you feel the formula sounds too can, you can change it to make it sound more authentic to you. I would encourage you to use the formula for a while to get used to it before trying to make variations on it. I used this exact formula with the chief marketing officer to get behind what he meant by castrate. Following is a video of the same co-workers and the couple you saw earlier, only this time they're going to try to use this formula, making it their own. Do you think this new interaction is more safe and respectful to each of the people trying it out? When another person states a meeting, stop and identify the feelings leading to the need in order to acknowledge that need, so you can talk about meeting that need. 
You know, when you come into my office and say these things, I feel like you're being manipulative. So, what I hear you saying is that you're feeling like you're powerless and don't have a choice. Yeah, that's exactly it. So maybe we could talk about how you can have a choice in this work. Yeah, I'd, I'd really like that. Okay. Well, while we're talking about it, I feel really disrespected when I come in here and you don't respond to what I say. So, are you saying that I'm not taking uh, your feelings of uh, responsibility and uh, respect into account? Your authority in the in workplace? Yes. Well, p perhaps we can talk about it and ways that I can better address this and uh, perhaps give you the, the, the dignity and respect that I'm supposed to give you because you're my boss. Let's, yeah, let's talk about that. But I, f I feel like when you come in here, um, you always come very, you, you criticize. You, instead of talking to me, you just criticize me. I'm just trying to do my best. So what you're feeling like is you don't have very much autonomy or yeah. um, support. Exactly. So maybe I can work on how we can talk with each other so that you feel more supportive and better able to do your job. I would really like that. That'd make this a, a lot easier. But this because you always you you abandoned me like a little kid all the time. It's all you ever do. Just leave me. And I'm 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 I don't I don't even know what to do with it anymore. I'm I'm really. Okay. Well. Um... <laughs> Honey, I, 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 you know, sense that you're feeling pretty, you know, abandoned right now, just alone. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I, I can work on being more punctual and, you know, not wandering off whenever we're you're out shopping. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I gotta say though that, I, I feel kind of attacked whenever you come at me like that. Sorry, am I making you like really mad? And do I? Uh, not like I'm not giving you what you need. Maybe I just need to be a little yes. bit more rational. Yes, yes. Okay, understanding and not jump off the deep end. Yeah, that would yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we can work on that. Okay. It's a lot better. I don't yeah. need you. <laughs> when you make up negative meanings or others throw them at you, it's easy to get triggered and let your reptilian brain take charge of how you react. This doesn't build relationships. On the contrary, it destroys them. To counter this, take the curious ABC pause. When you begin the curious ABC pause, you first hit the pause button to stop your automatic reaction and give yourself time to respond differently. Do not say another word. When you take a deep breath and then ask yourself a question such as, what facts might I possibly be missing or be completely unaware of? This sends a signal to your brain to turn your higher reasoning center back on. Questions form a vacuum in your brain. Your brain can't stand a vacuum and quickly goes to work to come up with an answer to the question. Questions flip the electri electrical switch in your brain. The same happens when you ask questions of others. You flip the switch on their higher reasoning center of their brain. You could say, hmm, I'm curious. What did I do that had you think that about me? Consciously choose curiosity about observations, the facts of the situation, for you may not always know what all the facts are in any situation. Get curious. So if you're going to honestly express, focus on what you actually saw or heard, the facts of the situation, and not what you made up about it. This is also what you're looking for when you're curiously investigating with someone else. What did they actually see or hear that brought them to the conclusion they came up with? In order to revitalize your relationships and elevate results, stopping your automatic reaction and turning on your higher reasoning center, the executive function of your brain, is a requirement. If you don't stop your automatic reaction and don't turn on your higher reasoning center, your relationships and results will suffer. If you do, they will flourish. 
The first place to focus is on exactly what happened. What did they see or hear that brought them to the conclusion they came to? Remember to focus on facts and not the meanings they made up in their head. You can't do anything about the meanings. You can do something about the facts by talking about them to confirm they truly are facts, which might help to change their meaning, or by gaining a greater understanding of why they made the meaning they did. This is what I did with the chief marketing officer of the hospital. I followed the feelings to the needs and got really clear on the facts. After that, we could do something about the facts to design a conversation to have with the CEO. This conversation would help the CEO have a new level of understanding about how he was treating the chief marketing officer and what needed to change in order for both of them to meet their need for safety and respect for the, all the subsequent meetings they would have. When you stop and get absolutely clear on the facts of the situation, the observations, meanings will change and so will the feelings attached to them. Then you can effectively address what actually happened so that you or others can get their needs met. You've got to get to the facts, not get stuck in the meanings. Needs drive everything we do, including our feelings and the meanings we place on others and situations. Our entire lives all flow around our needs being met or not. Needs are at the core of who we are and it's where we connect as human beings. We can use conscious curiosity or reptilian reactions to meet our needs. One is safe and respectful, the other promotes defensiveness and the lack of a human connection as we attempt to self-protect. Remember, curiosity is key to making the transition move away from your self-protective behavior, your unconscious reptilian reactions. Curiosity brings you back into the progressive cycle and short circuits the regressive cycle by creating safety and respect for others by asking questions instead of making judging, blaming, or complaining statements. When you are curious about facts, you are connecting with the reality of the situation, creating a common ground with others to gain greater clarity in any situation. If you focus on your meanings as facts, you are confusing the reality of the situation with what you made up about it. In the absence of facts, we make it up. We are meaning-making machines. This is where the drama and upsets occurs, in your own unconscious or conscious interpretation of the facts. The facts are simply what happened. Your results will depend upon where you put the focus, on your unconscious meanings or on your conscious facts. Thus we say, where focus goes, energy flows. Refer to your personal challenge. Turn to your personal challenge and fill in your observations of what you think the other person is observing that brought them to the conclusion they came up with. If they have a different meaning than you, they are probably focusing on different facts than you. This is where you can make a huge difference in your personal challenge by aligning on the facts of the situation and not getting stuck on what you made up about it. Go ahead and pause the video now to work on your personal challenge. Think of a conflict you're currently having. Is it because of meanings you've made up? Stopping and getting really clear on facts is a make or break situation in any conflict. Often getting clear on facts will help us create different meanings and when we share those facts with other people, they gain new clarity. You also now have a formula to address meanings people place on you. Follow that pattern and go back to the feelings. What are the feelings they have? Acknowledge them and then let it lead you to the needs and guess at what those needs are. 
The moment you guess the need, the conflict loses its charge because now you're going to talk about meeting their needs and what's more important to them than getting their needs met. The meanings we create can get us into trouble. In the next section, we're going to look at perspectives. The perspective filter is a choice we have that will help us create different meanings.